to my mic up. That might be a bit better. Can you guys hear me okay? Better. That looks better. Yeah, we can. Excellent. Um, sorry, I'm just getting something set up here. Um, you know what? I'm gonna. Sorry, I'm gonna be really annoying. I want to flip this around. Okay. Do that one, do that one, and I'm going to come here. Okay, that's what I want. Okay, uh, yeah, I can increase the mic. That's pretty, that's looking pretty loud to me. I think I was just whispering while I was working. How's that sounding? Is that sounding any better? Better? Okay. All right, I think that's pretty good. Um, okay, well, first of all, it's good to be back. It's good to see you all again. Um, I trust things have been well. I'm sure the project has been um, keeping you very busy. <laughs> so no worries there. And um, yeah, excuse my voice or anything if I sound a bit, uh, yeah, unwell. Um, all right, it's five past. What do we say we just get into it? Um, hello to all of you in the lecture theater. I don't know how many of you are there, but hello and hello to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Busy is an understatement. I completely get it. Um, how many people are in the lecture theater? Oops. Someone can let me know. Um, yeah, only a few more weeks left of this term, which is crazy. It's week eight. We got at least one person. Um, I miss him. Hopefully you're referring to me. That would be nice. Um, okay, so we have a, a pretty good lecture today, I think. Um, a very useful lecture, which is always good. Not to say that there are lectures that aren't useful, but it's an immediately useful lecture, I think. Um, it's an important lecture. We're talking about auth authentication and authorization, or auth and auth. Um, Concepts that uh, if you get wrong, maybe in the workplace, not so much in the course, um, you can actually end up in some serious trouble sort of institutionally, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why um, some companies or some um, issues like this actually end up occurring. So very important uh, topics, uh, but there's a big caveat. I remember the last time I gave this lecture, um, a few students got... I don't know what the word is. Um, but the caveat here is that this isn't a security course, okay? This is not a, a security course. I'm not even a security expert. Um, but as software engineers, we need to know um, how to be able to use the security tools that we have to interact with. Um, for example, when we're dealing with user passwords at login time, um, that falls into our realm of what we're responsible for. So we need to be responsible for, for handling that data correctly. Um, um, so, but yeah, this isn't a cryptography course. This isn't a, isn't a security course. We're not going super in depth into these topics. There's other courses, uh, for that. Okay. So caveat out of the way. Um, so yeah, you've probably done a little bit of auth, um, AR11, but, um, yeah, well, I think we're going to just expand on that a little bit. So, it hopefully goes without saying why we need authentication and authorization. So, uh, imagine if anyone could log into my YouTube account and go live, right? That would be pretty traumatic. Um, imagine if I could log into your bank accounts 
um, and act as you as you. A fundamental building block of the internet, of the web, of of software, is this idea of. Let me turn my iPad upside down so it doesn't get distracting. Is this idea uh, of being able to prove who we are. Very, very important, right? If you log into a web application where you've already created an account, you want to be sure that you're the only person that can do that. Do we, we should all um, agree with that. <laughs> but how do you? How do we do that? How do we build in authentication to software? Um, maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you haven't thought about it. Um, and these ideas goes back to you know before the internet. If you go to the local bank branch, right? You need to prove to some degree that you are who you are and that you have actions, uh, permissions to take certain actions. Um, So that's authentication. Authentication is the idea um, that I can verify who I am. I can prove beyond some degree of doubt that I am Jake Renzella and I should be able to access my YouTube account. And a really common way that we can do this is with passwords. That's exactly right. Um, And this is how you do it for 99% of the software you use, right? You have some special phrase, word, you know, hopefully a good uh, example of a password that ideally only you know. And so um, if I ask you for that password, which please don't type your passwords in the in the chat. That wouldn't be very good. Um, if I ask for that password, I'm convinced that um, this came from the person that um, created the password and no one else should have it. Now, it's not foolproof. People pick bad passwords. People leave their passwords out in, where they shouldn't. People have their passwords leaked in data breaches, which is what we'll talk about today. But um, we have two things we're talking about today. Both start with auth authentication is the process of verifying the identity of a user. Okay, is there any questions on the that high level concept of authentication? Yeah, those are some bad passwords, AR. Exactly right. No questions, I'm assuming? Of course, if you're in the room, in the lecture theater, you can put, you can type your questions as well on your phone or something. Okay, so authorization, what's going on here? So once you've authenticated, once you've proved to me that you are who you say you are, authorization is a process of determining what you can do. Um, here's a really, really, really obvious quick example that should demonstrate authorization. If you log into WebCMS, okay, you authenticate into WebCMS. Um, once you authenticate, uh, you're authenticated as a student account, right? You're a student account associated with a student ID and you have access to your information plus some general information that all users have access to, like, for example, an announcement. However, does that mean that you want you've that you've got full access to everything that can happen on WebCMS? Can you make an announcement? No, right? Only I can make an announcement, and maybe someone else like you, Chow, um, or a few other people in the university. So this is the concept of authorizing who is allowed to do what based upon the type of user account we have. Um, it's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, There's a few different models of it. One is um, a sort of a hierarchical model wherein you have like the root user, like someone just said, AR, and the root user can do everything. And then you've got maybe an admin. Admin can do almost everything except for like delete other admins. Then you might have users and users can do a subset of things. And then you might have a guest who can just view things, right? Um, but this, this process or this concept is authorization. And like I said before, um, if you want to go really in-depth in these courses, in these topics, in these concepts, there are dedicated cybersecurity courses on authentication, authorization. Yeah, root user is a uh, not just Linux, uh, but it's a, like an operating system concept, yeah. 
Um, but there's nothing stopping you from making some system and you have this concept of a root user um, or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly right. But an admin on Windows, you know, pretty much can access everything. So here's another example, right? I'm, I'm probably beating a... What's the phrase? Oh my God. Anyway, it's a bit of a rough phrase anyway. Um, I'm probably going on about it. I, I Hopefully you can sort of get your heads around this. If you're logging into Microsoft Teams, that's authentication. Checking if you're an admin or not, that's authorization. Yeah, yeah. It's just an ugly phrase, isn't it? Beating a dead horse. Okay. All right. So how do we actually do this? Um, what does it look like to authenticate? Um, well, someone pointed it out. I think it was AR. That's when we input um, some information about ourselves that hopefully only we or only you would know about yourself. Um, so you go to a website, you know, what's the first thing you see? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Members, owners, global users, that's authorization. Exactly right. And exactly right. Yeah. Owners can do things that members can't do, for example. Um, so we go, we go into a website and it asks us for our username and password. We enter the username and password. So what might something like this look like in actual, um, you know, code? Is this looking good size-wise? Can everyone let me know, please? I think that looks pretty good. All right, so imagine we have a few... Okay, so let's take a look here. So we have this data store. Now this is in a big, you know, in a normal web app or a backend system, this would probably be a database, right? Um, and in this case, we're just using a simple dictionary, just like you do in the project, um, most likely, to store the users when they log in, okay? A, a user is an email address, in a, an object, um, containing an array of uh, email addresses and a yeah okay so there's a few things you can do here you can register for an account right the first time you use something and you can log in pretty straightforward um, pretty straightforward examples Excuse me. Um, very, very simplified examples. Okay. Let's have a read through this. So um, when we register, we pass in an email and we pass in a password. We're, we're going to have to do this in 90, you know, in most cases where we have a, a, a username and password login field. So the function gets passed an email and gets passed a password. We check, you know, in our... Uh, users uh, list does that email already exist so we can't register a duplicate email that totally makes sense so this is just checking don't register a duplicate email okay oh my god caught out um Let's register the user. So if we do have a unique email now that we haven't seen before, all we're simply doing is saying um, set the, the value of the email to be the password and return true. So this is saying um, in the data object, store the email and the password. This makes sense, right? Because when the user comes along in the future to log in, we need to check that their password is correct, right? Do we all agree with that? We need to check that the password is correct. So we need to store it somehow. So they come in, they log in, and I know some of you already 
us screaming at the screen knowing where this is going but for the sake of the exercise let's go through it so you come on um, in in a week or so you click login you put in your email you put in hopefully the exact same password you check if you've got that user registered if you do you check is the password that was that was input into the field exactly the same as the password stored at the key with that email right so is the password the same and if it's true you return true Otherwise, um, you return nothing. And if you loop through all the passwords here um, and that you don't find one that matches, you return false. So this is like the world's first authentication system. Um, and the, no, I, I skipped ahead. That's a shame. And I know a lot of you know this anyway, but there's a huge problem with this, right? Um, and you're probably all screaming it. So what's the problem with what we've just done there? What's the problem with what we've done there? Yeah, SB passwords not stored securely. Um, what does that mean? Can you can you rephrase that? even simpler it's a hundred percent correct nope yeah passwords can be easily accessed it would be easy for someone to access the password so someone who said um, imagine a company actually doing that I had a quick Google um, if you've ever heard of a data breach where plain text passwords were leaked, that must mean that the company was storing plain text passwords somewhere, right? Um, I had one here. In 2017, one of the largest um, password leaks ever was discovered. A single file database with 1.4 billion email and password pairs, all in plain text. Look at that. Oh my God. Now, this wouldn't have been one company, right? A breach this size is likely a hacking group that have found many um, breaches, plain text passwords and emails. This is shocking. Um, and they went and found that many of these passwords actually were correct. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, this happens all the time. So... The reason, let's say, right, that we could have a guarantee that a password database was never, could never be breached. It was absolutely impossible to be breached, which is not possible, but let's say it was. We wouldn't really need to worry. We probably could just store the plain passwords. But the reality of the world is that no matter how good your security is, no matter how m much you follow best practices, no matter what you do, um, you need to assume that your database is going to be breached at some point. It could be a hacking group that is using a vulnerability that's not discovered yet, right? So there's apps, there's no way to secure against it. Uh, and that's called a, does anyone know what that's called? A vulnerability that has not been discovered or reported yet. Not a backdoor. A backdoor is when someone's gained access to your system and they can retain that access somehow over time. Anyone know? Yeah, zero day. Yeah, good. A zero day vulnerability. So there could be a zero day vulnerability in Windows, right? There probably are many zero day vulnerabilities in Windows. And these zero day vulnerabilities go for millions of dollars on the black market. And what this means is there could be some vulnerability in your database system that no one knows about, not the manufacturer, not you, not security experts. And so someone can gain access to your database where you're storing your plain text passwords. Um, what's another way that we are at risk if we're storing plain text passwords? Yeah, if you find one, you can make a lot of money, like a lot of money. 
Zero day vulnerability cost. Two thousand five hundred to two million um, five hundred thousand, depending on the impact of the zero day, right? Like if you find a zero day in Windows, you're gonna get like two million. If you find a zero day in Web CMS, you're not gonna get anything. Maybe <laughs> you are. maybe I'll give you a chocolate bar or something. But um what's another less sophisticated way um that we are at risk if we're storing plain text passwords in it, even if it is a secure database. Anyone? Take a wild guess. Yeah, exactly right. Free within me. Um, someone in your team might get a bit disgruntled. Might um, You might fire someone <laughs> and they go, screw you. I'm leaking all these passwords. Um, they might accidentally leave their account logged in and someone else comes along, right? Because COVID hits and everyone's working from home and they walk past their roommate's laptop that's logged into a terminal that's got database access to a secure database of username. All right, so you get the idea, right? We just do not want to store plain text passwords. So this solution is cute, but really flawed. So what can we do about this? We need to hide the password somehow. But, right, here's the, here's the challenge. Well, can someone tell me the challenge? Yeah, AR, you've got the techniques that we're going to be using here. But, yeah, that's right. We'll be hashing the password. The challenge is we still need to prove that the users are who they say they are. We still need to validate the password. So what does this even mean? So this is, welcome to the big, wide, beautiful world of cryptography. Cryptography um, is a field largely born from mathematics um, and, and um, you know, mathematical computer scientists. And it is um, the cornerstone of computing, really. Um, there's two high-level topics we'll be talking about, encryption and hashing. Um, both are similar, both have things in common, um, but they, there's a key difference between them. Uh, let's talk about hashing first, because that's what we are dealing with with our passwords. So hashing is a process of taking some input, typically a string like the word fox, and passing that string into a cryptographic hash function or a mathematical function that does a series of transformations on that input text. The result of this hash function is uh, something called a digest or what we typically call it the hash. So the hash is this string that if you look at it doesn't really mean much and the key is that no matter if you hash something like fox or the text, the red fox jumps over the blue dog or the red fox jumps over the, the blue dog with a little typo there, um, the hashes that you generate are equally distant from each other, ideally, right, if it's a good hashing function, um, regardless of the distance that the input strings have from each other. I don't know if that sentence made sense to anyone, but what I'm trying to say is I could give as my input the entire, um, you know, address of UNSW, right? And then I could put in as my, a second input, right? Uh, just the single character F. And you both, you get hashes that look, right, discernible. Yeah, the B-movie script. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Maybe we have hit you too hard with these project iterations if that's where you're, <laughs> that's where you're at. Did that sentence make, make sense to everyone? So you can see that even though these two hashes are only a character away from each other, the digest or the hash that's generated is completely different. In SB, you get the, the core concept here. You only get the same hash if the input text 
and the hash function, right, which makes sense, are exactly the same. So let's go here. So I could go Jake Ranzella goes to a hash and gets out, you know, some some hash key, for example. Or if I hash Jake Ranzella with a capital R, I'm not going to get like something very similar. I'm going to get something completely different. Wait, so the data can be longer. Can you clarify what you mean by that? And random account. So could that be a vulnerability of some sort? Can you explain what you mean by that? Could what be a vulnerability? While you type those clarifications, I'm going to grab a tissue. Excuse me. Okay, excuse me. That was, I just dropped a whole glass of water, so that was really good. Okay. So, random account, what, what did you mean by that? Okay, I'll keep going, but you can please type your questions. So, um, the important thing here is that hashing is irreversible. Ooh, hold on. Dropped water on my stove and now the sparker won't stop going off. Give me a second. Okay, I don't know how to stop it, <laughs> so I'm just going to hope my um, apartment doesn't blow up or something. Um, I don't know if you can even hear that. Oh my god, you can. Oh god. It's actually quite loud, isn't it? I don't know what to do. Let me Google this. 
how to stop um, gas stove sparking after getting wet. If liquid gets into the switch, you should disconnect the power to the gas stove and give the switch time to dry out. How do I do that? How do I disconnect power to my stove? Or oh, maybe, oh God, give me a second. I'm so sorry. We did it. We've done it. <laughs> I live another day. I just found there's a power switch. So if this ever happens to you, there's a power switch. <laughs> Hopefully under the cabinetry. All right. Never a dull day. Yeah, just disconnected the power and it just stopped. I just dropped water on the... I've never had that happen before. And... In the lecture break, I'm going to check if ChatGPT would have given me a better answer. All right. Let's get back to this. So, um, hashing... <laughs> so, let's recap really quickly. We take a string, we pass it into this special um, hash function, which does some mathematical manipulations on the string and res res uh, results in something called the hash. The hash is some string that is... Um, um, a one-way process. So if we pass that string back into the hash function again, we will get the exact same hash or digest as the result. But the process is irreversible. So there is nothing feasibly that I can do to this hash to get back the input string fox. Okay? Um, so it's a one-way process. So, can you answer random questions? Question, random accounts question. Um, do, do, do. Oh, Zefang um, was even better than Google. Turn off the electricity. Thank you. Okay. Um, if a hacker guessed some random string, saw the returned hash, and worked backwards to guess the hashing algorithm, um, <laughs> sorry, I was reading the, the diffusing a bomb. But, what, okay, so random account, great question. What you're saying is, if I could guess the word fox, I can then check that the hash is exactly the same, right? That's what you're asking, But the and you're correct. But if I've done that, then I've guessed the password anyway. I can just log in. Right? So this is why you get told, don't make your passwords simple and short. Because if they get all common... Because if they get guessed, yes, this isn't going to stop someone who knows your password getting in um, or from guessing your password. However, there are things we can do to try and limit that. So typically, right, if you're going to be guessing someone's password, you're either going to know the password in advance um, Oh, okay, sorry, I've misunderstood your question. If you know the input and you know the and you know the output, can you figure out what the function does and um, backwards engineer what the function does so that for any other input, you can understand how to get the output? Um, the answer is um, we already know what these hashing functions do. They are, they're, not, um, pr they're not obfuscated. Um, and the way that they, um, they work mathematically is such that even if you... I mean... I, I know we will be writing a hashing... Or we will not be writing a hashing function, but we will be using one that's open source. We will know exactly what it does. Um, but they are designed in such a way that even knowing exactly what they do um, doesn't allow you to go backwards from the hash to the password. Does that make sense? They are mathematically irreversible, even if you know what the hashing function does.
and I don't possess the uh, ability to sort of um, explain to you how hashing functions work. There's great YouTube videos, there's great articles, and you can go look at all that stuff. Um, are they one-to-one -one functions? I don't actually know what that means. You could Google it and let the chat know, please. Okay, good, great questions though. These aren't bad questions, these are really good questions. Um, so yeah, hashing is, um, these, are, these are publicly available open source functions that we use that are secure, that have been tested, um, that take an input, generate an output, and it's a one-way process. Whoops. Now, encryption is different. Um, encryption is a reversible form of hiding information, let's say. Um, and it um, possesses the convenience of allowing us to being able to reverse it. So, um, encryption, for example, could be if I've got this file that I want to store more securely, um, can I do something to the contents of this file such that um, without some sort of key, it's likely not going to be useful if it's been found while it's encrypted. However, if I've got the key, I can decrypt it and I can gain access to that file again. And it's a trade-off, right? It's a re This is... Uh, comes up a lot in computer science with performance and things like that. Uh, encryption and hashing are very, very similar concepts fundamentally, right? Maybe not in implementation, but conceptually they're similar. Because encryption is reversible, which is very useful, it's associated with having um, reduced um, security, okay? Whereas because hashing is irreversible, if I use a really strong hashing algorithm, um, we're pretty comfortable um, with the current state of technology that uh, if you can give the hat, you don't, you're not going to want to, but if you give out hashes to people, they're not going to be able to do anything with them without knowing the original password. Okay, so let's actually do some hashing together, which sounds like we're going to be doing something illicit, but we're not. Um, we're going to be doing something, the, actually, this is like the opposite of illicit. This is like how we secure people's private, important information. What's really cool now um, is that Node.js, which is what we use in this course, right? Um, actually, as an inbuilt library, has something called the crypto library, which contains a whole bunch of functions. In fact, let me get it up. A whole bunch of functions associated with not cryptocurrencies, but cryptography, including hashing, encryption, and a bunch of other things. Um, it's built into Node itself now, which is really cool because it means we can just import this library. We don't even have to download or install anything and we can start hashing some, some things. So let us... Um, SB, you ask an excellent question and I'm going to talk about that as we go. Okay, so let's go to... Let's delete this file. We don't need it. Let's go to our hashings... Hashings... Yeah, hashing file. Um, and we've got a bit of time today, so why don't we rewrite it? It's nice. And maybe if you're following along in the lecture theater at home, you can type this out as well. So the first thing we're going to do is import the crypto module from crypto. Crypto. And, um, oops. Okay. Well, it's a typo, that's why. Um, and because it's a built-in node module, um, we don't have to do anything um, to that. Okay, we're going to make our own function called get hash of a plain string. So let's do that. In fact, we can do it. Yeah, whatever. Function get hash of plain string is a string, Lord case s, and it returns a string. Um, let's just leave it out like that for now. What's the problem with this? Do I need to install it? Actually, which... um. 
I thought I can. Uh. Yeah, okay. We don't need to install it because it's a built in. That's what I thought. You can delete that. You can delete that. Is it just because I haven't used it yet? Anyway, we'll find out. Um, okay, return to string. Uh, we need to hash the plain string and return the hash. Okay, that's all we want to really do here. So let's let's actually go and do that. Um, we're going to be using the crypto.createHash function. Um, which we go here, create hash. So we can go over to the node.js library and read how it works. So it needs a few things. It needs the algori algorithm, excuse me, um, which is a string, some objects, uh, options object, and it returns the hash. Now, the algorithm, oh, I see. Maybe not, anyway. The algorithm, let's see here, um, is dependent on the available algorithms supported by OpenSSL on the platform, whatever. Um, so SHA-256, SHA-512 are common ones. On recent releases OpenSSL, you can uh, view the list of algorithms. So we can, if I've got OpenSSL installed here, I can view um, uh, let's have a look. Here we go. Um, I can view, these are the types of algorithms that we can use. The SHA is a very, very common form of hashing algorithm. Um, and the bigger the number after it, the more um, secure it is. So let me, I, there's one more concept that's really important to explain here. Where's a good way, where's a good place to put it? Um, where should I put this? I can write it as a comment here. Is that okay? So when deciding on our hashing algorithm, we also, we need to make another, um, what am I trying to say? Decision. Speed versus security. This is a big one. This comes up all the time in computer science. There's many different ways to hash a string or hash an input. If I want to be really, really, really fast, okay, um, I can use something like SHA-1. Oops, where was I before? Oh, it was in my terminal. I could use something like SHA-1, for example, which is really insecure. And what I mean by insecure is that, um, or MD4 is another example. And like, here's another way. Should I use MD4 for password hashing? And the answer is, um, well, that's not a great website. Um, MD4 is now considered insecure for password hashing. So because um, it's a faster hashing algorithm, it's less secure. And so people are actually able to reverse it because um, computing horsepower has gotten so um, powerful, right? But when hashing was, you know, in the earlier days of computing, MD4 was considered a sufficiently powerful hashing algorithm. Does that make sense? So what we want now, if we're going to be hashing algorithms, uh, sorry, hashing passwords, is to use sufficiently secure ones. But these more secure hashing algorithms are a lot slower. But there are other me there are other uses of hashing, right? So all of Git is based off hashing, but it's not hashing for security. It's hashing for some other properties of hashing. And so they want to use really fast algorithms so that they can hash, you know, that Git isn't really slow. Is that making sense? So when we're hashing passwords, we want to pick 
um, a sufficiently secure hashing algorithm. For now, let's just do ha uh, SHA-256, but then I'm going to talk about... Um, or 512 maybe, but I'll talk about what we would really use in industry if we're going to be um, hashing passwords. So all we do here is go crypto dot um, create hash. Now remember, I need to give it the password. Uh, sorry, the algorithm. So SHA two fifty six. Uh, and so this is like creating my hashing sort of algorithm and I pass in my plain string text there um, and then I'm asking to turn that into uh, a hexadecimal version of the uh, of the hash and then I need to I can return that or I can just say um, const hash is equal to uh, that thing console dot log the hash for now let's just do that and then we can return the hash good idea that's what it is thank you Tam whoops oh my god what's going on all right there we go nice um, so now we can we get the types and so on. We can view um, what we needed to pass in. All right, so let's just call this and give it um, a string, maybe ar11, right? Um, and it's gonna console it out. In fact, we can just let's just not do that. Just return this uh, and console dot log the hash of that okay ts node uh, and let's do hashing dot ts and we get out the hash all right very cool if i hash jake and then ar 11 again what are we going to see here hopefully the first and third hash are going to be exactly the same but the jake's going to be um totally different, which is what we're seeing, right? So I can go hashing AR11. Jake. And then that's a bit better. So we can actually see that AR11 has the same hash as um, AR11, but Jake gets a totally different one. In our authentication file, um, and we're pretty good. We don't need this anymore. Or I can leave them in commented if you like. Okay. And so the really cool thing is you, if you try this right now on your computer and you hash Jake or AR11 or whatever it else, you will get the exact same string, which makes sense because we need it to be reproducible so that we can verify that the password is the same. Now, how does this help us um, yeah, we'll talk about um, salting and um, stuff a bit after free with me. So how can we use this concept to improve our authentication program? And can someone tell me, um, let me comment this out, I guess. Can someone tell me what, um, what we could do here? Anyone?
Uh, if string is equal to string, then auth. Yeah, but which string would you compare? So we don't want to store the password for reasons we've discussed. So what could we do? Exactly right, SB. We can hash the password, store the hash rather than the password, and compare the hash. So we never store the password, and the, the hash isn't reversible back to the password. And we solve a lot of our problems. Exactly right, right you've all got it. So let's how do, we, how do we do this? So hash the password. Annoying. Um, now we already wrote a little function that can help us do this. So import, uh, what was it called? Get hash of, uh, or do I just go import from hashing dot okay, I think that's okay. Um, Let's do two spaces then. Okay, so get the hash of the password. So password, we can do something like that. Right. We still check if the email's in there, that's fine. If we are registering the user, instead of assigning the password to the email, we can assign the password hash. We return true and we're, we're, we're happy. Okay, when we're logging in, we have to do the same thing. So we can just copy this. We get the password hash rather than the password. If the password hash matches the, um, the hash associated with the email, we return true, otherwise we return false. Um, Yeah, yeah, thanks. And, um, okay, so now we don't store the um, password in plain text in our data store or our database, or whatever it is, we're storing the hash. And we can just simply compare the hash over here. All right, I don't think there's anything else that I, oh yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, cool. All Should we really have all data? I don't know what you mean by that. Sorry, for you within me. Do you want to rephrase that one? Oh, do you mean hash? Okay, should we hash all data? So you, what you're saying is, should we also hash the emails? Should we hash... Um, addresses and all of that. Um, <laughs> you would. Um, I, I don't know actually the, what actually happens if people do that. Typically, you don't really need to because the username is, is useless um, without it. Something like an address, um, yeah, you'd probably want to do something like that too if, if you don't want it to be associated in your database, for example. Um, but even if you're, if you're using, you know, yeah. But another thing you can do there is make, make sure that the pass, the address is not associated or associatable with um, a, a name, for example. But yeah, th definitely things like driver's licenses, anything important, um, you don't want um, necessarily to be sorted plain text. However, it's particularly bad if they can be associated with the correct um, user. There's a whole, um, you know, security in cryptography is a whole field, right? Um, and I'm not really the, the most... 
um, the best person to comment on what's best practice or not. Um, you know, let's see what Google says. Should I hash mailing addresses? Um, yeah, it sounds like a good idea to store a hash. For example, that makes sense to me as well. Yeah, the three questions thing that always worries me. It doesn't seem very secure at all. Okay, so a few things to talk about before we move on with hashing. For the sake of Comp 1531, this is a sufficient understanding. However, there's a few caveats that I need to mention. SHA-256 is not considered a safe hashing algorithm for uh, passwords. So is SHA-256 secure for passwords? Let's see what Google says. Um, okay. Okay, no, yeah. With recent computational advancements, it has become possible to decrypt SHA-256 hashes. So, <coughs> so one of the challenges is as computing gets faster, um, so does the ability to brute force these hashes. Um, but SHA-56 is typically considered as a general purpose hashing algorithm, not as a password hashing algorithm. So you might be asking, what um, algorithm should I be using to actually hash passwords? One of the really common ones is bcrypt. Um, bcrypt is a password hashing algorithm d developed in 1999. Um, it incorporates assault to in protect against rainbow table attacks. Um, blah, blah, blah. It is the, the hashing function um, used by OpenBSD, for example. Um, yeah, quantum computing screws us all up. Let's not, let's just pretend it's not coming. Um, I'm curious, actually, what does Mac OS use for hashing algorithm for passwords? Um... Well, this is not really what I wanted. Oh my God. Okay, so it's using a variation of SHA-512 with a large salt and iteration count in the, a large number. Um, that's cool. Um, Bcrypt is a really common, well, common one as well. Um, we'll talk about salting and iteration counts uh, maybe a little bit after the break. Um, but I wanted to point out that there is a... So I guess... Um, uh, yeah, so 5.12 is available and they're, they're using a variation of it that's not available in my machine. But there is a... Um, where did I have it saved? Uh, Scrypt or Scrypt Sync is considered a password ready hashing algorithm um, that's recently been available in crypto in Node.js. Um, it's a password based key derivation function that's designed to be expensive computationally, which is what we want if we want it to be um, sufficiently secure for passwords, uh, making brute force attacks unrewarding. That's a nice way of saying it. Excuse me. Um, please be aware of some caveats there. So you can use Scrypt by passing in a password, passing in a salt, passing, in, I think that's a number of iterations potentially. In fact, we can we can do this actually. Why don't we do it in our hashing algorithm here, just for fun? So we can return. Oh my god, return crypto. Dot script. Uh, we can use script sync. Pass in the password first. So that's going to be my plain string. Then pass in the salt. Now the salt. I'll talk a little bit about. It's a string. Is it not a string? Yeah, it's a string. The string's fine. Um, 
uh, that's like a that's like a secondary input into the hashing algorithm. We'll find up a, a better uh, explanation of that in a moment. The key length now I've never used S script before, so I don't know what this is. Salt should be as unique as possible. Um, blah blah blah. What is key length used for? Does anyone know? Well, they they're passing in sixty four here, so that's good enough for us for now. We can find out about that later. Um, now, because it's uh, there's no nothing else more to pass, is there? Um, that's just options. Uh, what does it return? It returns a buffer. How do we actually? Uh, okay, then you do, okay, that generates a key. And then we can go to string uh, in a hex format, just like before. Okay. Why don't we get these ones back? I think 64 is the length of the, um, of the, of this key. I think that's what that is. It's how long should the hash be? Okay, this is considered now. Well, this isn't secure because salt is a very bad salt. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But this is just considered a much more secure hashing algorithm that's password ready. Um. Okay, we can leave it like that if we wanted to. Any questions on this stuff so far? Chat's gone quiet. I don't know if that's a bad thing. Um, how many people are in this thing? 31? Okay. Um, let's quickly talk about, just out of interest, not because it's important. Um, so salt is like sprinkled onto the password before it's hashed to add some noise. I think the reason you, I'm not an expert on this. Someone in the chat might know better. Tam might know more. Someone can clarify. I think the reason we do this is to protect against commonly reused passwords um, coming up with the same hash in the same algorithm. So if, if I hash, if I hash the password, password it will produce a no a known hash right because password is such a common password um, but if I salt it first which could be like some sort of simple cipher like add one to each character to get you know Q B Uh, you know, something like that. This is a bad example, but d d does this make sense what I'm saying? If we manipulate the, the string a little bit first, then hash it, and that manipulation is unique to my application, um, then it's not going to be generating hashes that are um, common. Rainbow table attacks is a... There you go, that's a fancy way of saying it. Um The iterations, so we read that Apple does like something like 10,000 or 100,000 iterations. Um, iterations, I th I'm pretty sure is, someone can confirm, is rehashing the hash multiple times. So even though you've got a really secure hash, what if you just hash that hash again 10,000 times? If you, 
right? It's very computationally expensive, but um, it makes it even harder because someone else would need to know how many times to hash it as well as the input string, as well as the salt, right? So you can imagine, right? It, you're getting pretty, what was, what was the term that they used? Unrewarding <laughs> for your efforts. Okay, and that is a simple software engineer's um, look at um, hashing passwords. Um, yes, yeah, salting is reversible, but the salt should only be known to you as well. There's, and and um, there'd be lots of different ways of doing salting. Yeah, there's great videos on it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Where's my slides? I think that was it for this half. Um, okay, authorization. We're not really talking about it in any more depth in this course. I already spoke about it at the, at the beginning of the lecture, but it, to recap it, it's the idea that once you're authenticated, once I know that AR11 is logged in, free within me is logged in, who else is here? Tam has logged in. What should you be able to do? It's not a specific concept. It's an idea that people should only be able to do things that they're allowed to do. Um, we can grab those com computer file videos, it, computer file hashing and put them in the chat. There we go. Our good friend uh, over here can explain it. There you go. It took him an hour to explain. All right. Okay, please scan the lecture feedback QR code. Tom Scott, yeah, he's, he's awesome. Scan the lecture feedback QR code as always. I would really appreciate it. Um, all right, free within me. I will give you root access during the break. Um, everyone else, I'm going to go boil another kettle uh, with some ginger tea to soothe my throat. Um, post any more questions you've got. And then the second half of the lecture, what are we talking about? Complexity. Whoops. Cool. Okay. We all good? See you in five minutes. If I don't burn my house down. Don't worry, I'm not turning the power back on.
I don't even remember how long it's been. How long has it been? Is there no timestamps in YouTube chat? That's annoying. Three minutes, cool. So how are we all going? Tam, how are you going? AR11, how are you going? What does AR11 mean? Good, great. <laughs> yeah. Are you doing any courses, Tam, this term? AR11's been missing? Maybe I am AR11. Have you thought about it? And I'm back. Don't worry, I already looked at the lecture chats from the last few weeks. I knew. Oh, you graduated? How cool. How exciting. See, in a few short terms, you're going to be all graduated like Tam. Thinking back to these great old days of Comp 1531 lectures, right? No way. <laughs> yes way. I don't know, Tam, do you... Maybe you haven't been out long enough. <laughs> Another seven years? Damn. That's all good. People take different different paths, part-time study. I did part-time study for a while. I was trying to earn lots of money, you know. Yeah, you will miss it. I promise. I know now you're like, shut up. I never will miss this. This project's going to kill me. But they're good times. Ah, uh, double degree and part-time. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. I was initially in a double degree. And then after one week, I dropped it. I dropped it <laughs> to a single degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me about it. Rent's crazy. I don't know how you guys... I don't know. I am I can barely pay the rent. It's nuts at the moment in Sydney. Although I, I guess a lot of you live live far. Hey? Okay, that's probably been five minutes. Yep, inflation. Exactly. Um, um, okay, so... We're talking about software complexity today um, for the second half of the lecture. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about software complexity? We're talking about some terms, um, some sort of quantitative terms, some qualitative terms to discuss how complex software is. Um, so we have accidental and, and essential complexity and then we have a measurement a common one called cyclomatic complexity measurements um, that we'll talk about as well. So, what is software complexity? Can we get some ideas in the chat? Um, what do we think we're talking about when we talk about software complexity? Okay, big O notation, that's like algorithmic complexity. That's like a computer science complexity. We're talking about software engineering complexity, so like a step up from that, but you're definitely within the right realm for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, I like that. The, the opposite of keep it simple, stupid. That's pretty much right. Like if we've, we've discussed that keeping things simple is really good, um, if we're not keeping things simple, that's software complexity. That's one way of talking about it. 
the famous 1986 paper by Fred Books um, describes uh, software complexity in two categories, essential and accidental. Which do we want to have? Okay, actually, that's not a, even a good way of saying it. Essential complexity is like we must have it. We still don't want it. We don't want complexity. Complexity is um, time consuming. It's expensive. It causes bugs, even if it's essential. However, if it's essential, we have no alternative. Does that make sense? Um, accidental complexity is the type of complexity that will sink your business. Okay. Here's a really um, capitalistic way of thinking about it. Um, if you've got two uh, companies um, doing the same uh, service, let's say you've got um, YouTube versus Vimeo, let's say. I- I'm not, this isn't a real example, but let's just say. And um, storing videos and having a streaming platform is very difficult, right? It's expensive, it's complex, okay? But if you've got um, YouTube, which keeps things simple, and you've got Vimeo or something else that has a lot of accidental complexity, complexity that isn't necessary, and your competitor doesn't have that complexity, who's going to be cheaper? Who's going to be able to build more features? Who's going to be able to keep costs down? It's going to be the, the alternative without the, the essential complexity. However, both will need to have that essential complexity, right? Because it's essential to the product. Therefore, um, that sort of gets zeroed out. Does that make sense? It's inherent to the problem, okay? If you need to do 30 different things, then those 30 things are essential. We can't have a solution without them. However, accidental complexity um, um, is not inherent to the problem. We could have a more elegant solution without that accidental complexity. Um, Essential complexity can be managed um, with good techniques, but can't be removed entirely unless there's a technological breakthrough. Accidental complexity can be, um, can be, if you've got a really good engineering team, can identify um, complexity that doesn't need to exist in the system and can remove it. But have you all heard of this term, technical debt? Technical debt. Yep, so technical debt is this idea that you know, it's not straightforward to remove complexity or a- accidental complexity because, um, you know, I mean, you've probably already seen it just working on your project in Comp 1531, but you're like, oh, I want to change how this works. But if I change how this works, it's going to break these 10 functions. So I've got to fix these 10 functions. And now this simple change has cascaded into this big problem. Um and you're spending all this time removing this complexity, exactly right, rather than building a new feature that's going to generate value. So um, accidental complexity is really bad, and it's really similar, in my view, to um, over-engineering, right? On that, I actually wanted to... One of my favourite little... Um, little stories <laughs> um, is is um, has anyone heard of the Juicero or this story, the Juicero story? I don't know what this video is. I, I've just this doesn't look like a good video actually. But Juicero was this like juicer that came out of like Silicon Valley. Um, And it was like um, four hundred dollars, and then you needed like uh, a subscription to get juice. Have you heard of this? And it was like this magnificently engineered marvel of engineering. It was like the same technologies they put into um, making manufacturing cars. I just love this story. There's a, there's a particular YouTube video where this engineer tears down a Juicero. This one, this one. It's got like 2.2 million views. Um, and he's like, he starts taking apart this um, 
product and he's like, holy crap, this is like the most impressively manufactured thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was just to make some juice. And the idea is like you, you get these packets in your subscription and then you put the packet in the, the juicera and the juicera like makes a juice for you. And then it, so it was $400 US for the machine and then the subscription for the juice. And then it turns out that you could just get a rolling pin or like your hand and get like 90% of the same juice out as the $400 machine. Um, I don't know if this is accidental complexity, probably is something like that, but it's definitely over engineering and it's clear that this company didn't, um, didn't make it. If someone, I would love to have like a Juicero, not because I would use it, but just to have it. It's like one of my, I don't know why, I've just like, it's one of my favorite things. If the, the YouTube video that I linked is long, it's like 40 minutes, but it's really good. Anyway, um, we don't want to build systems like this. If we build software systems like this, we're going to fail. It's too expensive. It's too complex. It's too expensive to manufacture. It's too expensive to run. Um, so how do we, if we're trying to be the best software engineers we can, um, how do we avoid writing software that has this accidental complexity? Um, how much of complexity of modern software is accidental? To what degree has a will accidental complexity be removed in the future? So we need to know if we have uh, complexity. So how can we measure it? Um, there's a few ways. Coupling, cohesion, and cyclomatic complexity are quantitative measures of software complexity. Um, so let's look at coupling. Um, a, a measure of how closely connected different software components are usually expresses just a simple sort of loose or tight. Um, so let's look at um, web applications. So um, have you guys g been given the front end yet in the project? Have you used the front end? Even if you haven't used the front end, how does your back end and your front end communicate in Comp1531? Yeah, you've been given it. So, and you should know this anyway. So, what technology is being used um, to interface between the back end and front end? Hello, hello, hello. Use it for debugging to discover that half of it wasn't working. Well, that's good. Um, hopefully, you can fix that up. But so, how does the back end and the front end communicate? The server. And what is the server using? That's correct. Starts with a H. Come on, you guys should. What protocol are we using? Yeah, requests and responses, not hashing. You're using, you're using HTTP, HTTP, excuse me. Um, you're using post, get requests. Yeah, requests and responses, but you're using HTTP. Um, What's more tightly coupled? HTTP requests and responses or calling a function and getting the response in code? Can anyone think about that? Yeah, calling a function is more tightly coupled. Um, your code has to exist in the same code base. It's it, Okay, it might be less complex to write it, but let's forget about that. Let's talk about the coupling, right? Um, HTTP, like a get request, um, doesn't care where the sender or where the server, you know, how they were written. As long as the message comes in the same format, you get the response in the right format and you're, you're happy. They're not tightly coupled. Um, 
when we have different systems like a front end and a back end or like um, a mobile app and a back end or whatever it is, we don't want these to be very tightly coupled. And the reason for that is if I have to replace something, when you have tight coupling, you have to replace the whole system. Does that make sense? What's a good analogy for this? Anyone got a good analogy for this? Maybe Tam? Um, it's like modularity, right? It's like um, a tree branch. You might have to elaborate on that one. Um, it's like um, if you can't take your phone apart, right? Like the new iPhones are tightly coupled. You can't replace the battery. So if the battery dies, what do you need to do? You need to go get a new phone um, or you need to maybe take it to Apple and they have some special techniques for doing it. But a loosely coupled phone, a more modular phone is really, it's a lot cheaper and easier to replace that battery. Um, we want our software components to be modular, loosely coupled. Something to think about. Uh, if you cut the branch off, but the other branches aren't affected, are they? I mean, they're fine. They keep living. The tree doesn't die. Um, cohesion. So how well do different elements of a module belong together? Um, we want our software to be highly cohesive. Um, we want our elements of our software to be related. Um, So if we're dealing with, for example, user accounts, okay, and we have a, a, a lot of a few different files and a few different functions that handle user accounts, um, we would want to be highly cohesive if the user account object, you know, the keys and the values, the keys are the same throughout the whole system. That's good cohesion. If you start deal, if you start finding code bases, and you will find this where or in the auth section of the code, the user needs X, Y, Z key, but in other sections of the code, those keys don't exist on the object. I need to call some other function to get it embedded and blah, 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 blah. Um, that's what we're dealing with when we talk about cohesion. Um, these concepts are really important to be aware of, to think about, um, but not super important um, sort of in the immediate um, other sub branches. I understand what you mean now. I, I just got you. Yeah. Um, isn't sort of uh, as important in the immediate um, short term for Comp1531. Um, so look, let's look at this, right? So here's an example of a file called um, staff, for example. Staff have a salary and an email address and you can get their salary. Um, you can get their email address and everything that you can do in this file or in this object is associated with a staff member. Low cohesion, oh yeah, I can zoom in, sorry. Right, so this is good cohesion, right? Everything logically fits in this file, in this model. Poor cohesion is like, you got this staff file, you can check the staff's email, like what does check email really mean? You can send an email, you can print a letter, like that's got not much to do with a staff member, right? We want to group our code so that it's logical and makes sense. Cohesion um, helps reduce complexity because you can, you know, this is very glanceable code, right? If I look at this file and I read get salary, what do you think this function is going to do? It's, it, it's going to get the salary of the staff member. It's just super logical. If I look at this um, example and I look at print letter, right? And I ask you, what does this do? It's your guess is as good as mine. Um, you'd have to go read the code. You have to read the code. That takes time. That's complexity. Does that make sense? This is one of these code smells that as you become a better software engineer, you will look at code bases and say, oh, this doesn't feel right. Cohesion is like one of the names that we can apply to these things. Um, okay, cyclomatic complexity is one of these things that for some reason in every computer science or software engineering degree gets spoken about in um, the software engineering industry, at least 
in the types of places I've been, I've you've never I've never calculated cyclomatic complexity. Um, maybe if you're really trying to be efficient, if you're trying to do some static analysis tools, you will look at it. Um, but it's not something you'll be sort of hand calculating. There is a mathematical formula, um, but it's very, very simple to compute. Um, so, but the, the, the key is to have um, a function um, and you take the um, edges and nodes of the function to calculate the complexity. Um, let me get a really simple example. Here's a function called foo. It, it says if um, something is true, call b. If uh, otherwise, call C. What cyclomatic complexity is is a, is a way to evaluate how complex, or how many branches exist in this particular function. We can see that you always call A. That always happens. So that's a node. Then you've got two branches. You can either call B or you can call C. Very simple. Um, and then you always end the function, which is what this sort of end D state is. Um, you plug those numbers in, so you've got four nodes, four edges, so you go four minus four plus two is equal to two, so this function has a complexity of two. In general, we don't want highly complex functions. Um, so you can imagine somewhere like Google could have a rule that says, we don't want any functions that have a complexity of greater than uh, n, whatever number that is. Here's a more complex example. If you call a, um, if A is true, call B. Else, if C is true, call D, right? We've added some complexity. We now get a higher uh, cyclomatic complexity figure. Same thing goes for loops, for example. They don't really add a lot more complexity because um, it's the same thing happening over and over. So it's the same figure, basically, um, as the earlier example. Um, do we have one without? Oh, there's there's lots of different examples here. Um, do we? Want to, we'll run through one more. It's not too important. Um, so you start off over here. While so you got this loop here. Oh uh, yeah, a and b are functions. Yep, that's correct. This is a function call that returns a boolean. Um, let's do one more, more complex one, maybe. Okay, here's a good example. So here's a day to year function. Um, takes a number of days. You have some basic, um, uh, you know, calculating an epoch sort of thing. Um, while days is greater than 365, if it's a leap year, and if days is greater than 366, you take off 366 days and add one to the year, right? So you're counting how many years um, are in n number. Else, um, you go backwards and you, you add one to the year and then you return the year. So this works. However, it's got a cyclomatic complexity of four because you've got one, two, three, four, five, six um, nodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight edges. You you add your static two, and you get your complexity four. Here's a rewrite of that function that happens to be less complex, right? There's only now there's the same number of nodes, but there's less edges, and the uh, edges. Uh, it's hard without it being side by side. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that we have a quantitative technique to measure that this solution is probably better. It's less complex. Yeah, and uh, com cyclomatic complexity is often linked to nesting. That's exactly right. If you have deeply nested functions, um, then you're going to have a higher number, a higher complexity. There you go. So some people argue 10 should be the maximum psycho, uh, cyclomatic complexity. Some argue for 8, but around 8 to 10 clearly um, is a good way of having a way to measure um, how complex 
However, it's not perfect. It's a really rough estimate because you don't know how complex the branches that you call are. So, for example, the A function could be very complex, but then you could go off and measure A. Um, and it encourages splitting, uh, decomposing functions, right? It encourages breaking functions into smaller functions, which is like a sort of cheap way to get a lower cyclomatic complexity score. When what would be better is to making the code more understandable. So you don't want to just overly optimize for low complexity because then you'll just have one line functions, which is clearly a lot more complexity, uh, excuse me, a lot more complex. Some programming languages have tools to automatically calculate cyclomatic complexity. Um, and I don't actually know if, know if JavaScript is one of those. Um, calculate site. Um, let's look at this one. Oh, language agnostic. That's cool. Um, but JavaScript calculate cyclomatic complexity statically. Is there anything? ASLint should be able to do it. I think. Yeah, so ESLint is the equivalent linting tool in JavaScript. So you can set up rules to say, I don't want functions um, with a cyclomatic complexity greater than a certain number. And it automatically does it. And you can hook it into your um, continuous integration so that um, it will fail if you have a function introduced that's overly complex. Pretty cool to have. ESLint's very cool. Um, do I recommend it for iteration three? Um, that's a good question. Your project isn't big enough that you can't just look over it and try and find functions that look really, really long. Um, if it makes you sleep better at night, it would be cool to, um, to integrate it. You know, it's definitely not going to hurt. It just may not be super important. Again, in my experience, um, this isn't something that I've seen. It's like software teams be discussing or calculating. However, I'm sh I'm certain that it, at at really large places like your Google's, they have um, teams within Google that look at all of the software projects in the t in in the mono repo, and for example, may automatically scan for complexity to raise particular issues. So it's really something that you want to automatically calculate. Maybe if you're at a really large scale in a small team, a small project, you're better off just looking over the source code, doing um, good peer review, um, a merge request review, and working to simplify functions where we think they can be simplified. Um, but it's good to know that the tool exists. Um, ESLint in general is a really great, um, great tool. And a really nice website, actually. Um, yeah. Very well designed website. Okay, um, that's actually it. Shockingly, we're ahead of time. Um, you can read a few important um, or in informative um, links. Um, and here's a rebuttal to this original soft, uh, silver bullet um, PDF, which is quite interesting. Um, cool, so that's the lecture. Again, please scan your feedback. For once, we're not um, running over time, which is really nice. Um, we can we have fifteen minutes. We can you can head off if you need to head off, or I can make a quick kahoot. Do you want to do a kahoot? I haven't done them this year. If you remember AR eleven SB, I think you were in one five one one. Who else was from one five one one? Um, I used to do kahoots every lecture, and then this year they made it so that you can't have more than like a small number of people in the Kahoot. Um, 
but we can try. Let me log in here. Let me authenticate. Okay. Is anyone interested? How many people are interested um, in this? Oh my god, a 10 person limit, that's so rude. I mean, I guess it's fair enough. I can't even... I can't even get through. Where's like the continue button? Oh, it's right there. They really don't want you to find it, do they? What's the student pass? Anyway. Okay, the problem is I don't have a... I have to make one. Um, but I can quickly make one. Let me quickly make one. Three minutes. Uh, um, create a cave. Oh, God. Um, uh, I'm really not prepared for this. Give me some give me some ideas for questions. Okay, what's a good question? What's a good question? Okay, I got it. Okay. Pokes. Okay, that's one. Let's sure so we can take that. Um, okay. Okay, yep. Hashing, that's not a bad one. Have you started Duration 3? <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay, i got to move quickly here. One more. Um. Seconds.
Okay, let's go save. now start it uh, what's going on classic only 10 players it looks like but the first 10 to get in can play sorry about that We are waiting on COM 153 on iteration to auto test to be resolved first. Any update? Okay, I'm going to update on that. Sorry, I've been away a little bit. I'm going to do that straight after the lecture. Um, can we have a hint about iteration 4? Iteration 4 is not a secret. Um, there's a small spe spec component, um, but it's quite small. Um, it's completely individualized, iteration 4. So you do, it's not, you're not working on it in your group. But the real part of it, the real thing we want from iteration four is that you come up with your own feature, idea, spec, um, enhancement to the project that you want to make and that you go off and make it. It's an opportunity for you to sort of show off, to flex on what you know and what you can do. Um, it's technically optional. So other than the core spec part, um, you can just not get those marks. Um, so it's, think of it as like a HD task or something like that. Um, is this all it's going to let in? Is it going to let in anyone else? Maybe it's not. That sucks. I'm working on getting a paid license through the university. All right, let's actually, we can put the volume up. Maybe. Maybe not. All right, let's see. TypeScript adds static typing, dynamic typing, runtime typing, or a new language to the JavaScript ecosystem. Okay, well done. Oh, really? This lag? Only three of you? Okay, why don't we cancel it? How do I... Oh, 20 seconds, is that not long enough? Is this gonna work? Yeah, okay, hopefully this is, is longer now. RIP to misclicks. All right, question two. Hashing is, what's hashing? Still only 20 seconds. Part of the JavaScript library should not be used for passwords, a reversible cryptography method, an irreversible cryptography method. Move quickly. Seven. Okay, yeah, good for the seven of you. Um, it can be used for passwords if you use a sufficiently um, complex uh, algorithm. So good job, AR11. Compression is a form of cryptography. Ooh. Compression is a form of cryptography. What are we going to... Oh, 50-50. Brutal. But yeah, not really. C compression is just about making data smaller. There might be some similarities in techniques, but in general, um, it's not about security or securing. Um, all right, last question. What is salting? So is it rehashing a string, adding some random noise to a string after it is hashed? It's what you put on your food. Um, it adds some random noise to a string before it is hashed. Oh, my camera is probably in the worst spot, isn't it? Sorry about that. 
Okay, yep, it's what it's noise, the add before string, not after. Very strange, my option is earlier than the title. Hmm. Yeah, face can go, yeah, that's what you get. All right, this wasn't a great Kahoot. There wasn't long enough and it was pretty short, but Bob the Builder? AR11 in second and 3005. Is that a Childish Gambino reference there, Simon? Oh no, that's a point. Oh my God, that's so embarrassing. Oh God, uh, kill me now. I'm gonna go turn my oven back on and let it blow. Good job. Um, <laughs> good job. No Childish Gambino reference here. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get a, I've been trying to get a better Kahoot license from the university, but um, yeah, good job. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. As always, please give the lecture feedback here. On the iteration two auto marking, um, I will um, be, uh, talk to the team and see what's going on as, as soon as this lecture finishes. Sometimes these, these little things um, come up, but we'll get it fixed as, as soon as we can. Yeah, building is not, yeah, all the building companies are going under. So anyway. Um, I hope you enjoyed. It's good to see you all again. Um, we'll be back to regularly scheduled lectures next week and Wednesday I'm, I'll be feeling better and we'll be back in person. So apologies I couldn't make it in today. I'm going to go have a little rest though. Um, look after yourselves. Good job so far on the course. You're doing good. We're almost done. You will miss the course one day, I promise. See everyone.